Hello and welcome to Chairside Live. I'm your host, Megan Strong. Thank you for tuning in today. We've cooked up a great show because Dr. Mershon is here and she's discussing an exciting obsidian pressed metal case. She's placing obsidian pressed metal crowns on the first and second mandibular molars. As she's working on this patient, you'll see and hear why she chooses to use a full arch impression tray in clinical circumstances where there's no distal stop. Let's check it out. Take it away, Dr. Mershon. Hello everyone and welcome to Chersai Life. This is a clinical case of a 48-year-old patient that presented with multiple defective restorations on first and second endodontically treated mandibular molars bilaterally. Secondary caries beneath the amalgam on number 29 was also present. Traditionally, porcelain fused to metal crowns are used to restore badly broken or endodontically treated teeth to protect the remaining tooth structure. PFMs may also be responsible for maintaining occlusion as the crown on number 18 tried to provide with the presence of the metal surface. Here we can see how the effect of the masticatory forces chipped off porcelain distal on 31 and how aesthetics was sacrificed for strength with crown on number 18. In today's episode, you will see how I replaced these old crowns with obsidian pressed to metal. This is our new improved by layer material that, unlike conventional PFMs, will provide chip resistance without compromising aesthetics. I will also talk about the common mistakes in impression tray selection. For this case, I preferred to restore one side at a time, so the occlusal contacts on the teeth on the contralateral side will remain unaltered and prevent the bite from collapsing. The articulated models can introduce errors if occlusion is not registered and transferred accurately, or impression tray selection or bite registration is wrong. So I started with the lower left side first. We can see the first molar had a lingual crack and there was reoccurring decay under the large composite filling. On the second molar, we can see a PFM with a metal on lingual and on the entire occlusal surface. In the pre broxer era, clinicians will choose this non-appealing option for a patient with a heavy bite or for preparation very close to the opposing where no adequate occlusal clearance was provided. To remove the defective restoration, I use a razor burr to cut through the crown and a carbide burr to remove the composite. We can see that after cutting the occlusal part of the PFM, the metal was quite thick, so the occlusal clearance wasn't an issue for this endodontically treated tooth. So it is quite possible that the previous dentist choose to restore number 18 with a metal occlusal in order to withstand heavy bite forces and prevent the porcelain from chipping or fracturing off. Oftentimes in situations like this, when the third molar is not present to balance out the occlusal force, the second molar gets the heavy load and frequently fully covered porcelain PFM will fracture. An example of that was number 31 on the other side. To prevent this from happening again, we could have used Broxer, but I planned for the restorations on 18 and 19 to be obsidian pressed to metal and put this bilayer revolutionary material to the test. After removing the composite and preparing both teeth for obsidian pressed to metal crowns, I used the two chord impression technique. I utilized double zero size for the first chord and size one for the second chord. These are kneaded cords and when I place them dry into the sulcus, they expand by absorbing the gingival fluids, resulting in better displacement of the tissue. Here, camper caps were placed and we had the patient bite down to apply pressure for about three minutes prior to taking the impression. Common mistake that often happens in cases like this is providing the lab with a quad impression. Because here we have no occlusal stop distal to the prep tooth, it is important to provide the lab with a full arch impression along with a proper bite registration. This will minimize occlusal errors without running into the risk of having restorations low in occlusion. 
Here is an example that showed the difference in occlusal clearance when models from a quad impression were mounted in a plastic articulator versus model obtained from a full arch impression when mounted in metal articulator. We temporized using the two-unit split biotem CAD. The occlusion of the new biotem restorations was adjusted to ensure occlusal stability and patient comfort. Here we are trying in the crowns before final cementation. After checking the contacts and inspecting for proper seating, I will use an explorer to fill the margins to ensure there is no catch and margins are well sealed. With a 8 micron thin articulating paper, I'm verifying the occlusion. It marks and felt very well. No adjustments were necessary. So I am ready now to pumice the preparations and get the obsidian pressed to metal crowns ready for cementation. I always apply G5 before cementation, even on an endodontically treated tooth, because it is believed to have antibacterial effect and seem to prevent bacterial growth between the tooth and the restoration interface. When cementing metal restorations, I prefer Relix Lutein Plus. It is a resin modified glass ionomer self-curing cement that has a tack and wave light curing option, making it very easy to clean up the excess. There are a variety of materials that allow the clinician to manage restoring a patient with a heavy bite. However, some will sacrifice aesthetics for strength. We have now obsidian pressed to metal that has a lifelike appearance and it will increase the longevity of my restorations by decreasing the chance of them chipping. We are moving now to the contralateral side to provide the second part of the treatment. Here is the lower right that had three defective restorations, a fractured porcelain on distal of 31, marginal leakage under both PFMs, and reoccurring decay under the amalgam on number 29. The crowns are cut off using a zircut burr and forced open with the Christensen crown remover. After taking away the defective PFMs, we can appreciate the amount of leakage that has occurred between the tooth and the crown interface. We know that defective cast crowns with marginal gap between the crown and the tooth greater than 5 microns may lead to microleakage and secondary caries, and it is the most frequent reason for failure of PFMs. Once I get the restoration and caries removed and the preps cleaned up, the treatment plan is for 30 and 31 to receive obsidian pressed to metal crowns, while number 29 will receive an obsidian inlay. To finalize the preps on the first and second molars, I use a series of diamond burrs, and to remove the amalgam and reprep number 29, I use a carbide burr. For the distal carries on 29, I use a round Teflon burr. G5 was added to dentin to desensitize and remove contaminants, and vitrobond glass ionomer was added to the distal axial wall of number 29 and polymerized. An important step that I like to do before final impression is sealing the freshly cut dentin on number 29. For that, just before the application of the dentin adhesive, I use a diamond burr at a slow RPM with water spray. This is not to reprep the tooth, it is just to refresh the surface, to flush any debris away and refresh the dentin smear layer and have a totally clean surface. To seal the exposed dentin, I apply acid edge using 35% phosphoric acid, rinse and dry, and then apply a generous layer of OptiBond adhesive resin and polymerize. I use 10 second increments since it is a vital tooth. This will allow for cooling without damaging the pulp. With a Cavatron or a fine diamond burr, at a slow speed, we can remove the adhesive from the enamel and define the enamel margin before taking the final impression. The final impression is taken in a similar way as we did for the left side, utilizing the double core technique, providing mechanical displacement of the gingival tissue, enlarging the sulcus and allowing access for the light body impression material. Again, a full arch impression along with bite registration will be provided for the lab to minimize occlusal errors. Because immediate dentin sealing was done for number 29, I prefer to temporize the cavity with Fermit rather than having it part of the biotemp unit. 
I do this to avoid any interaction of the reline material with the freshly bonded surface. This will prevent any adherence of the freshly bonded surface with the provisional resin. Ferment is a light curing paste. It can be applied without additional application of temporary cement and it is particularly suitable for deep inlay preparations with parallel walls. We cure the ferment with the biotemp in place to provide good distal contact. After curing this material will have low elasticity and it will provide good retention for our temporary inlay. It can be easily adjusted onto occlusion using a fine diamond on a slow speed. Number 30 and 31 were provisionalized with splinted biotemp CAD. You can see here my assistant takes great care that the previously relined biotemps will have good margins and opens the interproximal embrasures to provide room for a interproximal proxy brush or flush thread to facilitate cleaning. Here is at the final delivery appointment. Biotemps were removed and note the ease with which the inlay is removed. Preps were cleaned from the excess cement using the caverton. Here is inserting the final restoration and inspecting contacts and margins for proper fitting. Also, occlusal was checked for any interferences to confirm a stable bite. Prior to cementation, preparations were pumiced with preppy space, rinse and dry. We use Relix Unisem for the cementation of the inlay and Relix Looting for the metal restorations. Here is my assistant using IvoClean to decontaminate the intaglio surface of the metal crowns. Here is using sealane to get the inlay ready for cementation. After preps were clean and dry, I apply phosphoric acid to the cavity preparation of number 29, rinse, dry and bond and then use Relix Unisem into the cavity and insert the inlay into place. I make sure the inlay is fully seated and free of excess before curing. These PFMs made of obsidian lithium silicate ceramic pressed to metal have great strength and are particularly suitable where the traditional PFMs failed. This obsidian combo restoration enabled good aesthetic results to be achieved and the patient was very happy with her smile. I hope this video showed you the importance of providing a full arch impression when there is no occlusal stop distal to the prepared teeth. To illustrate how common this problem is, I will share with you some examples that I gathered from the lab floor. It is not surprising that I found a few cases. Here we have case number one. A doctor sent this asking for a Broxer crown on number 31. We can see this impression was taken with a plastic triple tray. The lab poured the models and mounted them on a plastic articulator. When we look at the articulated models, there is absolutely no occlusal clearance. This happens because the patients tend to overclose when biting on a quad triple tray. We can minimize this problem by using full arch impression trays and a separate bite registration taken only over the prepared teeth. A plastic articulator also flex and bends if there is no terminal stop, altering the occlusal clearance. Usually the doctor gets a call from the lab to ask for permission to adjust the opposing. This will result in restorations being fabricated with the faulty occlusal contacts. To avoid this, the full arch casts can be mounted using the occlusal bite registration utilizing a metal articulator to stabilize the interocclusal space. On case number two, Knowing there is limited occlusal room between the preps of number 2 and number 31, the doctor requested two metal occlusal crowns. However, when looking at the articulated models, the technician still thinks the room is tight. Thanks for watching. Back to you, Megan. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Murashan. Well, that about wraps it up for this episode of Chairside Live. On behalf of everyone here at Glywell Laboratories, thank you so much for watching, and I'll meet you right back here next time.